This is the third largest mine of its kind in the world, and it's owned by Lonman, which is listed on the London and Johannesburg Stock Exchanges. It employs more than 20,000, mostly migrant workers, and they're housed in what even the company agreed were appalling conditions. Home for many is a sprawling, informal settlement of corrugated iron shacks in the shadow of the mine, without the most basic of services. They don't care about us, that we are struggling about water, we don't have electricity, we don't have houses, we are staying in the shacks. <laughs> In order to get a mining license in the first place, Lonmen had to provide details on how its miners would be accommodated and how they'd look after their welfare. But for the past decade, this mineral giant has caused misery to its workers, flouted the law, misled its shareholders, and never built the homes it promised. This place is Marikana, but what occurred here in 2012 echoed around the world. A strike had been going on for five days, and during that period, ten people lost their lives in clashes with the police. The situation was escalating. And the bottom line was that Lonmen did not want to pay an increase. They did not want to engage with their workers, and what they wanted to happen was for the police to resolve that strike. Some of the strikers had weapons, and the police were determined to disarm and disperse them forcibly, if necessary. On that day, the 16th of August 2012, 34 men at Marikana lay dead. More than 70 were seriously wounded. the shooting, the miners had gathered on this kopi, a rock outcrop, and today, at its summit, a single white cross stands as a memorial to those who fell. An official inquiry, the Farlam Commission, blamed the reckless behaviour of the police for the deaths, but it also examined the underlying causes of unrest that sparked the protests in the first place. The Commission is satisfied that Lonmin's failure to comply with its housing obligations created an environment conducive to the creation of tension, labour unrest and disunity amongst its employees or other harmful conduct. We couldn't believe that if the mine workers wanted a raise, want a living wage, they can be shut down. In the wake of the Commission, Lonmin said, it is certainly true that mining companies have faced criticism for their efforts to support the transformation agenda in the country. And on Lomin's behalf, we accept we must do more, particularly around the nationally difficult issue of housing. Despite promises, little's been done to provide adequate housing for the Marikana miners. <laughs> The shakes that when it's raining, the water comes inside and goes that side. And we are forced to climb on top of our beds. The other thing that we are struggling about is the water. Even the mine workers go to work in the morning after they must go and fetch water, look for water. It's platinum not water that Lonmin looks for. One of the most valuable precious metals almost uniquely found in South Africa and commonly used in cars and high-end jewellery. Before the arrival of the platinum industry, this was a rich agricultural area and Lonmin have a license to mine here until 2037. 
phansi kwelitye awazi noba nomhlanje zokuphuma The South African mining industry has always relied on migrant workers, a source of cheap labour linked inextricably to colonialism, apartheid and racial discrimination. And part of that history involved housing. Companies accommodated their mostly male workers in often squalid, cramped, barrack-style hostels. When the ANC came to power in 1994, it attempted to transform some of, some of these rapacious industries, like the mining industry. So the, it enacted new legislation and dropped a mining charter, which allowed for very specific transformative goals, not just in the boardroom, i.e. more black representation in the boardroom. It demanded that mining companies transform how they operated, that they move away from the hostel system, that they started building family units on the operations so that families could now live with the, their fathers and their brothers uh, on the mines and you know, not be broken up. And these became sort of codified in social and labor plans. Uh, and essentially sort of your, your mining licenses, your prospecting licenses are all dependent on fulfilling various social and labor plans. Lonmin drew up its social and labor plan in 2006 promising over the next five years to convert its 114 hostels, where up to 18 men would share a room, into bachelor and family accommodation. Lonman also committed to building an additional 5,500 new homes, which would be offered for purchase or rental to their employees, later saying that they had the finance in place. At the time, they employed more than 20,000 people at Maricana, and 68% were migrants. That was a decade ago, and to this day, most of Lonmin's workforce literally have little power. Now, if you go to Nkaneng, you'll see they have these, these huge electricity pylons, which, which goes out from this electricity generator to Lonmin's operations and to uh, various other mining companies' operations, but it doesn't feed the, that informal settlement. I don't see any safety here. It's very dark at the night. Lonmin hasn't honoured many of its promises or its legal obligations. It has converted the hostels and those not living in them are paid a living out allowance, but there's few decent places to rent. And the company hasn't constructed the 5,500 new homes. Instead, over the years, it's built a catalogue of excuses. The SLP commitment was not to build and provide houses, only to facilitate a financial arrangement to have them built. Most Gonmin employees didn't want to buy houses. Gonmin's employees are too indebted to buy houses. The financial crash of 2007 to 8. There is a shortage of infrastructure for water. There is a shortage of land. The government is responsible for housing, not Lonmin. In truth, Lonmin never had the finances arranged, despite what they told their shareholders, and it would appear that they never intended to build all the properties. In fact, they erected just three, show homes, and even those aren't up to scratch. The main problem is the, my toilet. This toilet, since I've reported to these people, Here is my solar tunnel that I'm using like this. When it's with this uh, dark, I'm lighting it like this. This one is the, the one at my, at my, my room. You see. This is how I struggle. The plot of land where Lonmin said it would be building the promised 5,500 homes was handed over to the South African government in 2012. It constructed this, a smaller state of social housing I thought that the people will go there to occupy those houses, but uh, there was no such a thing. Ironically, it's claimed that the miners earn too much to meet the qualifying conditions for this social housing. And when giving away the land, Lonman sought no formal agreement that its workers should benefit from it. <laughs> Is our 
Longman declined to discuss its fabrications and failures with Amnesty International, saying instead that they'd answered to the Farlam Commission. We do not intend to duplicate what was a most thorough process, and our failure to do so should not be construed as an admission of liability. <laughs> But some of the criticisms that underpinned the miners' protests, which resulted in the Marikana horror four years ago, is alive today. I think London doesn't use child labour. It uses adults. And as a result, they need to understand that adults need to be consulted because they can make their own decisions. Despite their legal obligations for improving miners' lives, the South African government, which should have held Lonmin to its promises, declined to speak to Amnesty about the company. What I wish to see happen in this community, if I can see the development, like people living in their proper houses, proper roads, water, electricity, and a good living condition, I'll be the happiest.